Okay, yeah, thank you. We're, we're good. We have a nice group of people joining us. Uh, thanks, everybody. My name is Harm Sherp here. Welcome to this webinar, HSX University webinar. The topic today is unpacking the value of the HSX NCQA DAV data aggregation validation designation. That is a lot of big words, and that's why today we're having this webinar to make sure that, that you all understand what it means, but also what it means to you and, and how it benefits your organization and how it should make your um, data gathering much easier by, by using HSX as an intermediary. It will benefit provider organizations, it will benefit payer and health plan organizations, it will benefit ACOs. I'm happy to see on the attendee list people representing all, all types of organizations, both providers and payers. Let me introduce the panel to you. We have three speakers today. First, Bill Morella, he's the Vice President of Value-Based Care and Data Analytics at HealthShare Exchange. Then we have Pantana Pandita, she is the Vice President of HEDIS Strategy and Analytics at the Amera Health Care Test Organization in Philadelphia. And then Liz Scholes, who is the Manager of Value-Based Care and Quality, also at HSX. My name is Harm Scherbeer. I'll be your moderator. I'm the Chief Medical Information Officer at HSX, also Healthshare Exchange. Um, those are my opening remarks. I would like to hand it over to Bill. Bill, please um, bring up your slides. and lead us away in unpacking the value of HSX and CQA data aggregation validation. All right, thanks Harm. Um, let me, you're not able to see my slides yet? Yes. Good. Okay. All right, great. Uh, well, hi everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, glad you could all be with us. Let me go over the agenda very quickly and, uh, and then we'll get into the content. So. Um, we're going to give a, an overview of what the NCQA DAV certification is all about and you know, uh, close that up with talking about what the benefits are for HSX members. As Harm mentioned, this is um, uh, something that is of direct interest to the payers, uh, but um, all HSX members should be interested in this because it will also benefit them in indirect ways. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the certification process that we went through and the results from our, uh, our first certification cycle. And then uh, Vanna will be giving us the, um, the health plan perspective on the certification and what it means to their business. And then uh, Liz Scholes will be talking about uh, data quality strategy and how that uh, factors into the results that we can get out of the DAB certification. All right, so let's just uh, start by talking about data activation. You know, when, when HSX started uh, 10 years ago now, um, the focus was really on moving the data around for treatment and care coordination purposes. Um, that is still critically important. We're still doing that work every day, uh, but we're now at a point where we're starting to leverage the data for, for many other purposes, um, population health, uh, clinical research, and, uh, and clinical quality measurement, uh, which is the, the topic we'll talk about today. So, um, you know, if uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, how quality measurement has been done over the last decade, it is a, uh, a largely manual process that is gradually becoming digital. And NCQA's uh, long-term goal is to make quality measurement an entirely electronic activity and minimize a lot of the um, uh, the day-to-day -day work uh, that can be automated. And you know, as you all know, there are uh, literally billions of dollars nationwide um, that are wrapped up in how well uh, payers and increasingly providers are delivering on the uh, the value of managed care. Um, our uh, our focus here is on um, uh, achieving this certification from NCQA and making the data available for quality measurement purposes to, uh, to the payer members of HSX. And, uh, and we'll get into the benefits of, of how that benefits the payers as well as the providers. Um, one key benefit that is important to both parties, I think, is that um, when payers work with providers today to get data for HEDIS purposes, that data is still subject to audit and is still considered um, what they call uh, non-standard supplemental data. I'll talk a little bit more about the, the different data sources that are used in HEDIS. Um, but by going through this process, the, pro the providers who are giving payers that sort of unstructured um, uh, or non-standard supplemental data are able to do it in a way that it becomes standard supplemental data. That eliminates a lot of work for both the providers and the payers. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that works. So the current state for HEDIS, I think everyone knows, including NCQA, that um, HEDIS has become administratively burdensome. 
um, quality measures have proliferated. And as, uh, as payer organizations grow and expand their panels, it gets harder and harder to keep up with the, um, you know, the HEDIS uh, requirements every year during HEDIS season. Um, it's a very a deadline driven process, uh, not uh, as much time as I know people would like to be able to deal with all the, um, you know, dotting all the I's and crossing the T's for HEDIS each year. And um, increasingly, uh, you know, numbers of, uh, increasing numbers of people having to be involved in chart chases, data abstraction, data validation. Um, and much of that work can be automated and free people up for, uh, for higher order activities. So NCQA has made a commitment. They would like to see, I think their goal is within five years, they would like most quality measurement to be done electronically. And they're relying on organizations like HSX and others who are aggregating this kind of clinical data uh, that is separate from the claims that are uh, sort of the primary source for HEDIS data. Um, and uh, that's part of what this validation is all about. So um, the data that is traditionally used for HEDIS purposes, on the left-hand side, you can see the administrative data from payer claims. That's sort of the primary source. You also get um, standard data from, from pharmacy and you have enrollment data that each of the plans manage. And then there's what they call standard supplemental data, like uh, uh, direct lab feeds or state registries, like a vaccination registry, and then uh, this non-standard supplemental data. So, uh, and that, that is what comes from chart reviews, the chart chases, and what they call pseudo claims, where um, people are pushing things like the Z codes or um, uh, whether someone's blood pressure is within range. That would be considered a pseudo claim. It's not a billable code, but it's it's a way for providers to push information to payers that is relevant for HEDIS purposes. And then uh, manual information. So as I said, I've heard of uh, instances where um, a payer requests for a provider to give them a flat file of all the patients of theirs that uh, you know were due for a mammogram over the the last year or so, um, and that's the kind of information that would really benefit from this DAV certification because the uh, takes all the audit requirements away from it. Uh, what is new here is uh, the uh, the circle uh, stack here, where HIEs and other data aggregators are able to um, uh, go through a process that is analogous to what the the payers go through um, during HEDIS season. And, um, and the data gets validated at the HIE level rather than individually at each health plan. And then ultimately, as I said, the, you know, the, the long-term goal here is to make more and more of this um, quality measurement activity happen electronically um, so that you know, each payer could have a, a fire-based uh, core model and a CQL engine, the clinical quality language. Um, uh, to be able to push data in uh, very discreetly downstream to anyone who needs it, whether that's NCQA, CMS, or, or other partners in value-based care arrangements. So um, one of the ways that, uh, that this benefits uh, both payers and providers is, as I said, taking away the audit requirements that are typical um, in, uh, in the HEDIS uh, workflow. So the, the top uh, bar graph on this slide is showing what the typical workflow is. So uh, a data source would be a provider organization, someone's you know, original uh, electronic medical record. Um, that data might be shared with a data aggregator such as HSX. And then uh, in the past, we have shared uh, some of that data with our health plan members um, to use for HEDIS purposes. But what they have to do when they've done that is they use the HSX data to identify people who either A, may still have care gaps, or B, may have had closed care gaps, but they need to go grab the documentation back in the original EMR to be able to use it uh, in, in their HEDIS calculations. So, uh, and, and you know, then it is subject to audit when they go through their, um, their validation with their, uh, with their HEDIS auditor. Uh, what the DAV program does is basically take the data that HSX holds and validates it eliminating any further audit requirements when the data is shared with the payer. So as you know, basically the, um, the validation activity is moving uh, upstream a little bit in the workflow. And uh, by HSX getting a lot of that data uh, validated upfront, it, it you know, eliminates the need for a lot of chart chases and manual data abstraction downstream. So uh, some other benefits for, for our members. So 
um, uh, first of all, we hope that this will result in better uh, performance on value-based contracts for everybody. Um, you know, we we hear that uh, you know providers are increasingly um, building more and more measures into their value-based care arrangements with payers, and this data would be used to calculate those results, presumably as well as the payers' results that they share with NCQA. Um, we also think that this data is data that might not otherwise be available. Um, so uh, you know, it saves uh, the payers from having to go to um, individual providers separately to get this data when they can just connect once to HSX to get it. And then um, another big uh, improvement that we hope will, will benefit not only this use case, but, but many use cases for the data that HSX holds. NCQA is trying to standardize the CCD format further than it has been standardized to date. Uh, you know, the CCD standard has been around for many, many years, but everyone has implemented it a little bit differently. Um, providers are not always um, looking for the, um, the data aspects that would make it usable for HEDIS purposes. So, for instance, if, if a physician's NPI is missing from a procedure, uh, it may not be usable. If information is coming over undated, uh, it, that may make it unusable. And those are the kinds of things that we're looking for in the data. So, um, you know, we really think that will benefit everyone downstream, uh, not just for the HEDIS use case, but for everything that, that HSX does. Um, and as I said, you know, uh, there's an ROI here, even just in eliminating the chart chases. Um, but even if that weren't the case, uh, you know, getting one better uh, point on a, a HEDIS measure can be extremely significant financially to, uh, to payers, um, you know, in their HEDIS results. So um, you know, we know that this is beneficial. Uh, all of our uh, payer members are interested in using this data, and we'll you know we'll work with each of you to uh, to help you get that on board in your workflow. So I'll talk for a minute about the DAV certification process and what we had to go through. Um, we had uh, there are basically three legs to this um, the certification. One is that uh, NCQA wants to make sure that we have the right policies and procedures and systems in place to, um, uh, you know, to be able to uh, aggregate data reliably and that we have the right uh, quality mechanisms in place that we're, you know, evaluating that and responding to issues that we identify. Secondly, as I said, uh, NCQA wanted to make sure that HSX could output a, uh, a CCD format that was compliant with NCQA's implementation guide. And then third is this primary source verification. Uh, process that I'll, I'll talk about in a bit more detail. So um, NCQA, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit just in the interest of time. Um, so the, the primary source verification process is basically one where for each site that HSX wants to get certified, we have to um, produce a random encounter um, and show that on, on our output CCD and then go back to the uh, provider organization and get an original document from the EMR that basically uh, validates every, all the data that HSX holds. Uh, the chart that I'm showing right now is probably a little bit too small for you to read, but I wanted to just show you the complexity of this. The, um, the fields on the left-hand side are the ones that NCQA is looking for um, to be in the CCD, and which of those fields are required or optional um, depends on what care setting um, uh, is being evaluated, as well as what kind of encounter it is. Um, the requirements are extremely detailed, and you know we're look, having to look at the field level in these CCDs to make sure that we have the uh, the right data for this. And it is also a, a very compressed time frame. So there's only a, an 18 week cycle in the DAV certification. So there's not a lot of time to um, uh, deal with any surprises or, or um, you know, we had a number of cases where we had trouble getting um, data in time from the providers to be able to use for this process. So I uh, just wanted to communicate the, the importance of the timeliness in um, getting those medical records. And then um, finally, I'll, I'll wrap up here and just tell you what our results were in the first cycle. Um, so we uh, we did, uh, we had partial, we were partially compliant uh, with respect to the standards. But there were a number of uh, areas where we had to um, make changes to our data quality procedures or our onboarding procedures, and uh, those are the things that we're in the process of now. And we did have uh, two thirds of sites pass the primary source verification. So uh, not everyone passed. That, that uh, from what I understand, that's normal. 
Um, but uh, we did get two thirds of the sites passed and uh, pretty much all the ambulatory sites were the ones that we got passed, which are the ones that are most important for HEDIS purposes. That's where most of the um, care that will drive your HEDIS measures uh, will occur. And uh, Liz will talk a little bit about reasons why sites might not have passed and, and some of the data quality issues that we uh, are looking for in CCDs. But before we do that, we'll turn next to, uh, to Vanna to talk a little bit about the, the health plan perspective. Thank you, Phil. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, happy Monday. Uh, I definitely uh, want to be able to share some of the thoughts that we have at AmeriHealth as it relates to the DAB program and partnering with HSX, which we um, continue to, to really uh, appreciate the progressiveness and their intention to support uh, HEDIS reporting and um, the payers and providers within the Philadelphia region over time. I would say one of the things that, as Bill had suggested, that has really been important to us and we have looked for um, HSX as they have gone through the certification is the broadening of the data set. I think when we consider the value of HEDIS, whether it's to a payer or to the provider community, that value is only um, increased as we have more data to truly represent the activities that are occurring within the marketplace. Um, on any given day, I think as a provider or as a payer, one of the challenges that we continue to face is the real-time nature or accessibility of data um, and that true, accurate, comprehensive view of what's occurred within um, an encounter at the time of an encounter. Being able to access these data um, in, in this validated data set allows us to have a broader um, a broader perspective of data within the provider community so um, instead of having to integrate or um, work with individual providers for individual flat file data exchanges that are cumbersome both on the provider um, and as well as on our end to ingest and to ensure that those data are valid um, it broadens the 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 sense of provider, the set of providers, but also just the data that's within it. Because now, like Bill had up on that previous slide, if there's race ethnicity data that's available within that CCD, that helps us to continue to um, enhance our data set. If there's data that's specific to an encounter that we may not have originally been focused on with a provider, the, the DAV validation um, process allows us for that greater, that greater set of data. Um, it also, uh, I think what I'm looking forward to in as we go, as we move forward with this, is the continuation of data because now you have a regular cadence of validated data that we don't have to go back in and request a medical record for validation purposes from our providers. That is um, for the providers that we've engaged in data exchange with. Um, part of, I think, part and parcel, one of the most cumbersome, time-consuming aspects of HEDIS in this non-standard supplemental data source activity that we've been engaging in. Anything that moves us to more consistent process um, that is that is validated and really allows us to focus in partnership with H um, HSX or with our, par our provider partners um, to really focus on what care is being rendered and where the potential gaps are so that we can share um, data with the provider community as well as internally within within our organization. I think that that's been um, something that we that we look forward to with this partnership. I also, uh, one of the other benefits that I would say is the ability to really improve measurement. As we know, HEDIS has been in the marketplace since the early to mid 90s. Um, and it's been very process oriented, very based um, historically on transactional data. What this will now allow us to do as we move forward with a more 
with an integrated approach with our HIE partners, with our provider partners, is that the, the, the measurement process will become more accurate, more robust, again, enhancing the overall intention of what's meant to really become an outcomes-driven, data-driven process for improvement of care within the ecosystem. And, and I know from experience with NCQA as well as with the HSX team, we're all really focused on that continued opportunity um, for our for our membership. I think, of course, the most uh, one of the most valuable opportunities for both the payers as well as for the providers is that reduction in, in burden of the, the medical record or the chart chase process. As, as Bill had, had outlined earlier, that, that um, even during HEDA season is very time dependent and very intense for our provider partners. But as we all know, um, on an annual basis, regardless of whether we're in the reporting season or we're collecting data um, from June through December, the, the constant barrage of requests for medical records um, to support these non these non standard data sources and these non standard channels is 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 annoying at best um, and the the opportunity to have the digital data I think is going to be incredibly impactful for any one of us that's participating in this process I'm going to Hand it off, Bill, unless you had something else that you were thinking of. Um, if there was a question, I'm happy to hand it off to Liz, who's going to really walk us through some of the more um, detail of the validation process, as I understand. Yeah, that's, that, there are there are a few questions on the on the question board. I'll, I'm tracking those, so let's first listen to Liz, and then I'll open up to the floor for questions. Thank you, Vaughn. Liz. Okay. That sounds great. Thanks, guys. Um, thank you, Vanna, and thank you again, all of you, for joining us this afternoon. Um, what I'm going to walk through today is um, HSX's overarching data quality approach. Um, so as you can imagine, um, really that inbound data is something that we needed to take a look at in order to ensure that we could capture um, measures appropriately through this certification and, and make that data more meaningful for um, not only HEDIS purposes, but really, as Bill mentioned, all of our use cases. Um, so I'll start by um, discussing really our pre-DAV data quality controls, which are still existing today, um, and some of the inbound CCD issues that we are aware of. Um, I will then introduce our um, data quality strategy that was um, implemented recently, um, new controls relevant to DAV and speak to specific HEDIS measures, um, as well as data quality report cards. Um, and then we'll wrap up with some um, action items we have so, for our provider and payer members. Um, so we'll recognize, um, or we recognize that um, really data quality issues had to go hand in hand with our certification, as I mentioned. Um, it was just, uh, it made sense to do these things in parallel because we were already biting off a big chunk, uh, a big effort, and um, we needed to make sure that it was going to be most impactful. Um, so it really improving um, on our data quality addresses um, use cases across the board. So improving the value and usability and interoperability, um, taking a look at coding and um, just formatting and, and specifications um, was all uh, necessary. They all had um, layers of the project were all important to make this all work. Um, so this slide outlines really our pre-existing controls prior to DAV. Um, at a high level, we have specifications that are based on uh, different data feed types. So whether you're sending ADTs or CCDs or labs, um, each of those types of implementations have their own uh, specifications that we ask our inbound uh, data senders to adhere to. Um, we have standard onboarding processes, including testing and um, a QA process that is actually repeated. Um, so once during tests and once um, during like a soft go live. Um, in, in those, the QA process does also include validation using um, analyzer tools, uh, which I'll speak more to um, in a few slides. Um, we have structures and procedures in place for 
monitoring uh, throughout that onboarding process. So um, tracking tickets in JIRA, we have Slack alerts, um, and then ultimately um, multi-level approval to actually go live. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, through this process, we identified some, um, some, as you can imagine, inbound data quality issues. Um, even with all the controls in place that I mentioned in the last slide, um, inbound data is very messy. There's variability, and um, not only between, you know, it, amongst the same EHR, there can be a lot of variability. Um, and so uh, CCDs are are really where we were focused on identifying the biggest. Um, those main issues so that we could make the the inbound data most impactful um, that's where we're going to find the the rich clinical data that will carry over um, results and procedures that are really relevant for um, HEDIS measures um, it'll also contain more of a picture for the patient uh, record including immunizations and medications and allergies um, so for many reasons CCDs are a large of large interest to um, to HSX to receive and make sure that they're being captured appropriately um, so this um, this slide really highlights some of the the issues that we wanted to address um, and the first is is increasing the number of data centers who are actually sending us CCDs. And, and I would actually add labs as well to that, just because labs and CCDs are really where we're gonna find a lot of those results, as I mentioned, for HEDIS purposes. Um, but it, it's important that our data centers are sending us this data um, because the more geography we can cover in terms of those data centers, um, the more impact, impactful, impactful our data will be for our members. So um, if we have better coverage throughout the region and we're receiving this data that has that more complete information, we'll be able to turn around and give you that data um, you know, more, uh, more completely. Uh, we're also working to increase the number of ambulatory specific CCDs, because as Bill mentioned, ambulatory encounters are really where we're gonna find a lot of those HEDA specific measures. Um, and then ensuring that measure uh, related activities are actually getting documented in the EHR is another um, important piece of this. Um, as well as uh, the, the final three bullets really highlight some member specific issues that we will address during uh, data quality meetings. Uh, some of you have already had the pleasure of joining us on some of those data quality meetings, but um, if you haven't yet, we might be reaching out to your team. Um, but it, it's just really important that the CCDs that get transmitted to HSX have that um, appropriately coded and complete sections and um, and where we expect that data to come over is actually coming over where we uh, where it is. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we realized that this was a lot to take on and a formal strategy was needed to, um, to align all of our efforts here. So the purpose of our data quality strategy is to really improve the usability of uh, data for population health, value-based care, but as mentioned, it really helps everybody across the board. Um, we, um, this effort involved you know, formalizing a data quality management plan, as well as uh, structured policies and procedures to help guide our efforts. And all of those were presented to relevant committees and necessary channels to make sure that we got the appropriate approval across the board um, along the way. Um, HSX's data quality strategy also in, involves uh, working with a, a new to us vendor, uh, Stella Technologies, which has a few um, tools that we are leveraging, Stella iq and Stella Prism. Um, iq is more of a, a report card style um, uh, scenario, and I have some scenario or screenshots of those later in the presentation. Um, and it shows really specific uh, member performance on completeness as well as syntax of uh, clinical messages that get sent over to HSX. And then PRISM is more of a, uh, a data warehouse that we can use to load our data into and do some enhanced queries and troubleshooting and just uh, overall usability functional checks. Um, so IQ allows us to build out uh, specific rule sets, which has been really helpful throughout this uh, data quality um, process. Um, so we made some specific to HEDIS, uh, of course. And so those report cards have helped us evaluate really the status of our data today, um, but also work with our members on specific data quality agendas, as I mentioned. Um, and then of course, annually pursuing the NCQA DAV certification. Uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, throughout this process, we also had to implement new controls. Um, as I mentioned, we created a data quality management policy and plan, uh, but we've also come up with, for the first time, um, put together a data quality work group. Um, we're just looking at data quality more closely, not only um, across the region, aggregately, but also drilling down to those specific issues that we can present, um, really pri prioritize and then share with members um, who are impacted. Um, we're also screening for those HEDA-specific codes, um, and we've implemented weekly volume reports to understand um, expected volumes for different data feeds, and as those vary up or down, uh, we can actually respond more quickly uh, because we know what to expect. Um, we, I already mentioned Stella, iq and PRISM tools, which have been really helpful to give us a different lens um, into data quality. And then um, we've also added specific uh, data quality projects um, in JIRA and a tag on our existing um, HIE engineering board for better tracking and assigning of data quality tasks. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a list, I hope you can see it okay, but it's just a list of HEDIS measures that uh, we use to really begin evaluating our data against the particular measures. Um, so we worked with a number of our health plans to um, try to understand the, the priority measures uh, from their perspective, and we cross-referenced that with, uh, with our data and what we believe we have the best coverage of um, to really start with those measures. Um, to you know, get the biggest thing from our for about from the beginning. Um, that's not to say we won't get to the the those that are listed in orange, but it just gave us a way to prioritize because um, there was a lot to work on. Um, so the color coordinating doesn't really mean anything, just aside from how we uh, really tackled them internally. Um, next slide, please. Um, this slide illustrates uh, really the, the just the sheer volume of HEDIS coded data uh, from for just one calendar year um, for the measures that you see listed here. Um, so we're very confident that we have um, a vast database of HEDIS specific data. Um, the issue really is um, fine tuning the coding and the CCD formatting and the triggers. Um, to make sure that we are capturing those measures as best we can and um, that they're getting uh, identified within your respective HEDIS engines. Next slide, please. So this is, um, this is iq -ed. This is a screenshot of uh, one of those report card style uh, reports that uh, we actually produced uh, for a test patient. Um, and we just wanted to illustrate here how we are able to get scores based on different sections of the CCD. Um, so as you can see here, allergies, medications, um, and in the uh, error list, there's a column that has errors and it's actually a link. You can actually drill down into those specific um, errors and take a closer look at where the problem is and how to identify um, uh, troubleshooting. Uh, next slide, please. So this one also may be a little hard to read, um, but iq allows us to, like I said, drill into uh, the, the details by section. Um, so it'll indicate the number of errors, where the error exists, and the details about um, you know, how the description of that error. So um, as I mentioned previously, these rule sets are all customizable. So it's been really helpful for us to um, set it up against NCQA specs, for example, so that we can just have that level of evaluation of our data against what they are expecting to see um, so we can kind of get ahead of and mitigate any issues as we are tackling this uh, throughout the year. Uh, next slide, please. So now we have officially wrapped up our first year of certification for measurement year 2021. Uh, but as I'm sure you all know, uh, the cycle never really ends. Um, each year is an ongoing process and we're already gearing up for measurement year 2022. Um, so uh, not only do we wanna continue obviously improving the data usability, um, but over time we wanna add more data sources to our certification. So. Um, we weren't certified across the board. As Bill mentioned, we, um, we, we get certified by clusters, uh, which are EHR plus um, care setting. And so adding to our certification really 
increases the number, the amount of data that can be usable for your teams. So um, this new post-DAV world for HSX um, actually involves doing primary source verification on a rolling cadence, um, as opposed to you know, doing that big rush at the end of the year, which is, um, I, I can imagine, um, it, you all had an even harder time as health plans going through it, but we we got a small slice of it this past year, and it's it was a, um, a chaotic uh, feat. So, <laughs> um, so we are in implementing that to try to um, ease the burden, but also stay on top of these issues throughout the year so we can, like I said, get ahead of things and, and understand what our data is inbound so we can make it more usable outbound. Um, we are implementing data quality thresholds. Um, so we're working to set up thresholds based on message type and different use cases. Um, just to kind of establish some expectations around data completeness, and um, and it's the first year we're doing this, so it'll will will you know create some thresholds and and see what works, um, and, and we'll have to be flexible as we we implement this. But um, it like I said, it'll it'll establish some expectations that um, I think will be helpful um, to try to raise the bar across the board. Um, Data transmission logs are also being used to track those data sources and clusters, um, really to the NCQA uh, team's benefit, but it, it really helps us um, uh, align our, our efforts and figure out um, which clusters are going through the process. Um, we're also working to get uh, standard code sets such as LOINC, RxNorm, um, ICD-10, our usuals, um, updated with our vendor NextGen. Um, and we're finally also getting NextGen to address an issue where codes and or descriptions um, are being auto-linked um, really just internally uh, within the system. And um, we, we've asked them to address that as that really can introduce the uh, too much variance or, or potential misinterpretation if, um, if they're automatically assigning a description to a particular code or vice versa that actually they don't, um, you know, uh, they aren't one-to-one. -one. Um, so those are some, some post-DAV controls. And I imagine this will continue to grow as we go through the process yet again for recertification in, in, in the coming years. Um, but this is where we're at today. Uh, the next few slides are some action items that I have. So next slide, please. Um, for providers, so this is a team effort. Uh, we rely on your participation, and um, really, it's it's everybody is working to um, make our data more meaningful and usable. Um, so, really, for the few providers who are not yet sending CCVs or labs, um, this is just a request to to please begin doing so. Um, that's where a lot of our HEDIS uh, specific data will be captured and um, really it helps make everything more uh, meaningful if we have the more data that we can share with our downstream receivers. Um, as a heads up, I think I mentioned, um, we may be approaching some of your teams for um, primary source verification. Um, and, and we also just ask that you work with us and, and your EHR to address any data quality issues that we may bring up during um, those data quality agendas that we have with, with our members. Uh, nobody's perfect, we're just trying to move the needle forward for everyone's benefit. Uh, last slide, please. Um, so for the health plans, if you receive DAV certified data for measurement year 2021, we do not need to change anything. Your existing channels, provided they are um, you know, working on your side uh, and, and no issues in terms of endpoints, um, those are good to proceed for 2022. Um, if you'll be participating for the first time in measurement year 2022, we will need to set up a unique channel. Um, NCQA does not allow us to um, commingle uh, certified data and non-certified data. So um, HSX, we can share that implementation guide with your team and specifications, as well as some um, sample uh, CCD or consolidated CCD files for your review, um, just to prepare for ingestion um, in your particular HEDIS engines. Um, and then of course, once it comes time uh, to do so, you'll need to um, list HSX in your roadmap and we will share the appropriate 5A documentation at that time as well. All right, I think that's it. We can head over to questions. Thank you, Liz. And go back on screen. Vanha, maybe you want to join us again. Really appreciate it. Lots of information. Um, 
I'd like to spend the last 15 minutes answering some questions, questions from the audience. I already see some of you putting a question there. If you have a question, please type it in under the question set in your, in your um, webinar screen, webinar bar, and I will pick it up from there. And to start with, there's one question. It's, it's a straightforward question, but I think it's important to address. Is sometimes these data streams don't keep track of if somebody is the same person whether they have the same person ID. If Mrs. Jones here is the same as Mrs. Jones there. My, my que the question to the panel, I think, is first of all, how does HSX manage that? But also, how does NCQA validate that? Was it part of the validation that we are properly able to identify the same person with the same person? Who would like to answer that? Liz, you want to take that one? Sure. So um, HSX has a, um, in, uh, a, a patient matching algorithm that uh, requires that um, a particular level of uh, threshold is met and um, everything is scored based on uh, patient first name, last name, address, uh, phone number, um, you know, social security number, um, telephone. So there's different criteria that are listed in there, and each of those different um, uh, identifiers has a, a score. And so you have to get above a 24, I believe it is, in order to uh, for our system to find a match. Um, Social Security number, for example, is something like 20 points or something, because that's a highly unique number that isn't going to be, um, you know, replicated. But first name or last name has a lower threshold. So it would you would have to have a number of criteria meet in order to identify a patient match. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll just add to that uh, where this factored into the NCQA certification. Um, they did ask us a number of questions about how our master patient index worked, you know, as, as Liz just described. And, um, you know, they did look at some of the documentation and, and policies around that to make sure that we are actually getting and ingesting the data needed to, to make those, uh, you know, high score matches. Good, thank you. Question for Liz as a clarification to something you just said before. I think you said that from a payer perspective, and maybe Vanna, you can weigh in on this also, a payer needs to separate out their NCQA validated data stream from their other data stream. Can you explain more what you mean by that and how does a payer handle these two separate data flows? What do you mean by that? Yes, absolutely. Um, it can get very confusing. So um, from a health plan's perspective, your, um, you can receive the data to any endpoint you want. It can be the same endpoint uh, your real-time CCDs can go to the same endpoint as your DAB certified CCDs. But from an outbound perspective, HSX has to send from a unique channel. Um, and that that's the, the really specific um, criteria that NCQA requires. The reason being, um, when we um, set up your channel, NCQA validates our data stream. And so we can't have data mixed, validated and unvalidated data. Um, they just don't allow that to, to be sent over together. Um, and the NCQA um, longitudinal CCD that we send outbound is actually locked down to those specific um, certified data sources as well. So it, you wouldn't even, we would query the CDR for the, uh, the certified data sources. So it, it wouldn't even capture all of the other data sources in HSX. So um, really the biggest benefit or the biggest um, recommendation I have for a health plan is to have both your raw CCD data feed that you get your usual data and you can use any of that data for HEDIS purposes. You just might have to, it's considered non-standard supplemental and therefore you would have to do the additional audit on it. And then in addition to that, use the, uh, the certified NCQA data stream from HSX as well. And that data would come over, we would share the list of certified sources and you would know that that data is not required for um, additional auditing. It's considered standard supplemental. Um, it's just the, the stream that, data, that HSX sends outbound to you has to be unique. Well, and I would just add from the from the incoming side. 
Yeah, I was going to say, I would just add on the incoming side, it, it, although it doesn't, we don't have the requirement that it remain unique from an NCQA standpoint um, in terms of just that transmission of data. It is important, just like Liz said, the data has to be sequestered as validated data versus non-validated data because they will be audited in two separate, in two separate manners. Validated data will go through the standard um, HEDIS audit process, so it doesn't require us to do the PSD because that, um, HSX has already conducted that. The non-validated data that is not coming through a DAV certified channel, we would, as a, as a health plan, still be required to, to conduct that. So in, in any instance, from a payer's perspective, it's important because the data can't be commingled on our end either, even though um, it may, uh, you could receive it technically at a single source, um, at your SFTP or your SFG. I think from, uh, from a payer perspective and from anything that I've seen and what we're doing, it, it's important, I would say, to have two distinct um, locations where you're landing the data, whether it's a requirement or not, my suggestion would be it's important from a from an audit standpoint. What you do not want to do is, in any instance, um, find yourself in a place where you've commingled the data and are not able to um, filter out the validated from the unvalidated. Uh, as you're going into audit season, because then you will not be allowed to use it as, as validated data. Interesting. And that Thanks. wouldn't be any fun. <laughs> so. um, another question is, I'm not sure if it's too soon to know this, but have you been through an NCQA audit, and what was the reaction of the auditors to having HSX, Health Information Exchange, data included as part of your, your HEDIS data set? Mm -hmm. um, oh. We have been through an audit. Uh, unfortunately, the, the timing of the certification with NCQA this year, as Liz knows very, very well, did not leave us with um, enough time to really fully integrate the data. Um, our audit team was actually very, very um, keen on being able to use the DAV data um, for our audit. It just it it was just a, a little bit of a troublesome um, experience with the timing for this year. Uh, I, I am a former HEDIS auditor, and so from my experience um, uh, within the ecosystem, it. The opportunity and I think the intention of the DAV program would uh, is it is is so impactful for the for the providers for the payers as well as for the suppliers of the data that the more data that you're focused on bringing in for, through a DAV channel, the better off you will be as it relates to an audit process. Not to mention the other benefits that you're going to have from the reduction in, in um, burden to your provider partners, the reduction in potential cost as it relates to chart chase and you know, the year round aspect, as well as just a greater data set. I think you're gonna have, we're gonna see a much more um, accurate and enhanced level of data um, within the year or two as more, as more uh, uh, suppliers go through the process as well as we as plans get better at integrating it, understanding it, and then being able to share it forward. Uh, I, I have a couple more questions, but I just want to point out what you just said, Mama. I think you just recap in the last minute what this is all about, right? You said chase, chart, chart chase reduction, burden reduction, and better data. So mm -hmm. I, I think you captured it right there that that's the purpose for doing this, that it's less work, less burden, better data, so therefore better quality measures. That's what this is about. Um, there are some additional, thank you for, for, for recapping it right there. I couldn't have said it any better. <laughs> you just did. Um, um, the question from the group audience is some um, ambulatory strategy. Liz, you highlighted that there, the ambulatory side, we, we have more data gaps on the hospital side, but many of these measures are fed by ambulatory data. What's our strategy to um, increase our strength on the data side there? 
Yeah, actually we have, um, I would say we have fairly uh, good coverage of ambulatory sites at this time. Uh, and many are sending CCDs today. Um, the very few who aren't, uh, we're, we're either working with technical limitations or, um, you know, timing of resource uh, migrations and things like that. Um, but yes, absolutely. Um, you know, focusing on increasing our ambulatory um, data feeds is is of huge interest. And and those not sending or who are sending CCDs, the next step is to try to get them to send labs if applicable. Um, you know, so we're the ambulatory sites are have definitely come into big focus. Um, with respect to HEDIS, but also other use cases. It's just a, a, a big uh, place where you can, you know, really improve patient care. So um, yes, our, our strategy is to increase either the data feeds or the data types um, really uh, with respect to, to ambulatory data. And, and Harm, the, the other thing that we're looking at with respect to ambulatory data is whether the, um, the care that is given in ambulatory settings that is relevant for HEDIS purposes is actually making it into the CCDs that come to us, even from sites that, that do send CCDs. So we found um, there are a number of procedures like mammograms in particular, uh, uh, colorectal cancer screening, things like that. Procedures may off, will often not hit the CCD if the CCD is generated the day of the encounter because the coding may happen after that um, so we're doing some experiments now with some of our members to see if we, um, for ambulatory visits, if we delay the generation of the CCD by a couple of days, does that get us more procedure data than would otherwise show up? Um, but uh, you know, we also have the situation where, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, where uh, payers are sometimes asking the providers to just give them a, a CSV file or an Excel file of all the members who have had a particular procedure and give me the dates and the, um, you know, the locations and all that. Um, even that data could be ingested by HSX and, uh, and validated through the DAV process. Whereas when the provider just gives it directly to the payer, it's still con it considered um, non-standard supplemental data subject to further audit. So there's, there's some value added for both the providers and the payers to use HSX as the conduit for that kind of data exchange. Um, one of the attendees is the hand raised. If you have a question, please see if you can type it into the question box. I, I get it that way. Um, I'm not sure if I can unmute your audio right now. The um, this DAV certification process for HSX does is that specific to health information exchange organizations, or are there other types of organizations who also do data aggregation who also get their data? Uh, validated by NCQA. Then one of you, what do you think, Bill? You're shaking your head. What, what, what do you think? Is this an yeah. HIE uh, I, I, yeah, I think um, I think uh, to date HIEs have been the majority of the uh, organizations that have gotten certified, and I, I think you know we were probably the um, you know the mental model for for uh, the program overall, just as as data aggregators. But um, I think there there are clinical registries that have expressed interest in doing it. Um, there may, uh, I don't know if there would be benefit to um, like an all-payer claims database getting the certification. I don't think I've seen that yet. Um, but you know, if, if they're dealing with claims that the payer would already have, I'm not sure how much more you know, valuable that would be. But um, it's not specific to, to HIEs in, um, you know, in the requirements, but to date, HIEs have, have been focused on it. Okay, good. We're almost at the end. I want to ask all of you, one final question before we wrap up. So my, my last question is, with all this background, can you boil it down? What's your one recommendation to your peers, to your either provider or payer peers? Let's start with one. What is your main recommendation to your peers to say, this is how you are using this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the first recommendation is to definitely um, engage. Um, if you don't engage, you won't know. Um, and, and that's, that, I think that's the first step. Uh, I would say that, um, in any, in any instance, you've got to be able to bring this data in to really have that long-term strategy, like Bill said earlier. NCQA, CMS, 
just about um, any regulatory body in the industry right now is moving towards digital data measurement. And that means that we have to have the data in the correct format, that the transmission is, is um, real time or close to real time, and that it has to be co as comprehensive as possible so that we have that more um, accurate and robust measurement. So uh, the biggest step and the hardest one, I think, is to engage. Start asking the questions if you're not already. And, and what do you mean with engage? It's start asking questions that I did, but also do you mean engage HSX? I mean, I, I mean, email is, and, and is that what, what you also mean by engage? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. If you're, if you're a payer and you, have, and you have the opportunity, I would definitely say you want to engage. If you're bringing in data, then if you can, if you can divert any of the data that you're uh, ingesting from HSX to a DAV channel, then there's definitely benefits of that. If you're a provider, I would say the opportunity is, is even greater because you're going to be able to reduce your burden so that my team or someone from our team is not asking you for a flat file exchange that might be relevant to two of the, the 10 measures versus being able to share the data for all 10 measures across the ecosystem of your panel with the appropriate payers. So it really removes the burden of your own staff and your and your team um, in the office, which with the pandemic we know is already um, a, an opportunity and a significant burden. Thank you, Barbara. In, in less than a minute, Liz. Take well, away there are actually two, two questions that came in similarly that I just want to address quickly. Um, the NCQA requires the the unique channel. It's not something that uh, we have seen any flexibility on. So I just wanted to address that quickly. Um, if that were to change in the future, we would definitely, you know, um, pursue other mechanisms. But at this time, NCQA is, um, you know, making that a, a standard at this point. Um, but Vandana said it so well. Um, the only thing I would add is just like, this is a team effort. Um, we can't do this alone. We uh, we need our providers to come to the table. We need our payers to engage. We we need our internal team to be uh, analyzing all this data. It really we're trying to raise the bar across the board to help everybody. So um, you know, come with us on this journey. This um, has been we've said it many times. This has been a transitional year for us. Um, we are hoping to get you know even more data meaningful for your your teams um, in the coming years. I'm going to have to cut you short and Bill short. We're at the top of the hour. I want to thank Anna, Liz, Bill very much. This is super interesting and also very applicable, very practical. Thank you to the audience. I hope this is very interesting to you. We will post this session on our website very soon so you can re-listen for, um, for important sessions. Thank you, everybody, very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.